You know, I love podcasting. I have since 2006, back when you had to use like a Dixie cup with string to make the thing work. And that's why I'm so excited that we recently moved Mysterious Goings On to Anchor FM to record our podcast. I got to tell you, I don't regret it a bit. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. I'm not going to lie to you, when I first heard about Anchor, I was a little dubious because I've been doing it the hard way for so long. But I got to tell you, it's very easy. Use a Stripe account get sponsors, you're not paying monthly hosting fees, the sound quality is great, the distribution is phenomenal. Friends, download the free Anchor app today if you want to start your own podcast or go to anchor.fm to get started. Remember, you heard it here first on Mysterious Goings On. Welcome to Mysterious Goings On. I'm Alex Greenwood. You know, one thing I've learned knocking around the planet low these many decades is that there are no good guys and not as many bad guys as you might think. People are, instead, often defined by the lines people cross to achieve their aims. That's why today I'm excited to venture into the last frontier of Alaska, where author Russell Heath has set Rin's Crossing, a high-stakes, high-octane dive into the gritty political battles that have ripped Alaska apart since statehood. Russell's pretty interesting. In his teens, he hitchhiked to Alaska and lived in a cabin on the banks of the Tanana River. In his 20s, he lived in Italy, then traveled overland across the Sahara, through the jungles and over the savannas of Africa and into Southern Asia. In his 30s, he sailed alone around the world in a 25-foot wooden boat. In his 40s, he wrote novels. And in his 50s, he bicycled the spine of the Rockies from Alaska to Mexico. He's worked on the Alaska pipeline as an environmental lobbyist in the Alaska legislature and run a storied environmental organization fighting to protect Alaska's coastal rainforests. In 2010, apparently wanting more frenzy in his life, he moved to New York City, where he dug deep into leadership development and coaching. He now lives in a cabin on the coast of Maine, coaching businesses and nonprofit leaders intent on making big things happen in the world. Today, let's ask Russell Heath to be our guide into the wilds. Russell, welcome to Mysterious Goings On. Hey, Alex. Great to be here. I, I, you know, your, your bio reads like uh, kind of an Indiana Jones kind of thing. Um, you, you've, you've, you apparently were imbued with wanderlust from a very early age. Yeah, well, wanderlust are running away. You know, you're never, never quite sure. <laughs> and um, yeah, and, and, and it's, you know, it's a question, you know, people often ask me is why do I, why do I wander? And, and I don't know. You know, I just think it's it's the the particular hormones that are floating around in my in my bloodstream of which I over which I have no control unless they come from oatmeal or something. So, yes, I've got a lot more a lot more places that I'd like to visit as well before before I shuffle off my mortal coil here. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about Alaska if we could settle in here um, for which is the setting for Rinse Crossing. Was it your initial, you know, sojourn into Alaska? Is that, did that just kind of set itself into your mind and your psyche? And you, you, and then since you spent so much time working there as well, was it just natural to set the novel there? Well, natural, I suppose. I mean, I didn't really have a choice. It, it was, it was really the only place I knew. And, and, you know, I, I spent most of my adult life in Alaska, but the, the, the thing too is that I, I knew the Alaska legislature really, really well, and you know, if, I'd be curious, you know, in, in your your experience with with mystery and thrillers, whether you know of another legislative thriller, a thriller that goes through a state or federal legislature. I don't think there is one, and certainly not in Alaska. But I couldn't have written about any other legislature because it was only the Alaska legislature that I knew. 
Well, there is um, the uh, the novels that was done by the late uh, host of the PBS News Hour, um, in set in Oklahoma, my home state, that where in the hero or the two or three novels was the lieutenant governor. And my gosh, I'm blanking. I I used to be a PBS executive, and I've met this gentleman, and he passed away a couple of years ago. Oh my word, I'm embarrassed. But he did write a series um, based on the Oklahoma State Capitol of mysteries. Okay, but I would say, yeah, you. That's the only other thing I can think of that has anything to do with the state legislature. Oh, well, I'll have to track him down. Yeah. When I get you, when I get, when I remember something here, you know, it's tough being in my fifties during COVID. I don't remember much, but I will send that to you and, and let you check that out. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have a little bit of a background too. Um, I ran for legislature in Oklahoma a few times. Um, and I also did, a, was a lobbyist for a little while too. So I am particularly interested in, in the, in your stuff too. And, and then the last thing I can tell you, that's a little bit of a hook. When I was 14 in high school, they had a program called close up where you uh, go to DC, right? You've heard of, yep. you heard of close up. Used to run and, it. Oh my, you did. Uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I, I worked for a firm where we had the contract to run the close up program in Alaska. <laughs> okay. Then you're not going to guess who my roommates were. Oh, uh, Tony Knowles. <laughs> My roommates, though, were Alaska kids. It's uh, I was the Oklahoma contingent, and our roommates were the Alaska kids. Who who? Um, what year was this? This okay. I would have been fourteen. I'm fifty two now, so eighty two or three, I guess. Okay, so I'm a little older than you. I was I was working in that firm in my twenties, which was in the seventies. Then no, I take that back. It was the eighties. I was there in the eighties. I may be. Maybe these maybe I would have known some of those kids. I bet you did. I mean, I and I, it bothers me that I can't seem to find uh, all the uh, you know, because you know, you will keep in touch, you know, but I'd love to find a couple of them because I just remember it was just a great experience. Um, but anyway, so those are my uh, little connections into your world. And I'll stop talking about me here. This is not about me, but I just found I, that's why I was particularly excited when I learned about your work was I thought I have all these touch points in my life that seem to fit here. So that said, I, I, I want to ask you a couple of questions just in general about Alaska before we could get deeper into the book, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and bearing in mind that what I know about Alaska is that and, uh, um, you know, some, some television programs. But um, what are the most common misconceptions people have about Alaska as far as you're concerned, people who don't live there? Oh, you mean like it gets cold there? <laughs> Well, that's a, that's a good question. I don't know what the common misconception would be. Um, you know, it does get cold there. Unfortunately, it's getting much warmer over the last, and it's, it's much warmer in Alaska, you know, percentage wise, and it is in the rest of the country because the Arctic or the poles, the Arctic and the Antarctic are warming more quickly than the temperate regions. And so much of our infrastructure is based on cold that it stops working when it gets warm. But that's a good question. I don't know what it would be. Um, I would say two things. When I went up to Alaska, so I hitchhiked up there in 1974, and then we were really isolated. So like they, f they would fly up the, the Walter Cronkite type tapes from the, you know, the CBS Evening News. So we would watch Walter Cronkite the day after so our news was already 24 hours old by the time we saw the CBS evening news. And now, of course, Alaska is just completely cooked in to the, to the rest of the country and the Internet, as is any other community in Alaska and the United States. It's not isolated in that way. In fact, most of the, in, most of the native villages have broadband going right into the villages. Oh, you know, fantastic. High quality broad, broadband. Yeah. Yeah. But what would I say? Well, there's sand dunes. I don't think most people realize that there's about 300 square miles of sand dunes, almost in the Arctic, Arctic Circle. Had no idea. No idea. <laughs> All right. There's a misconception un unveiled. There you go. Well, that's good. The reason I ask that is because when people pick up your book, I, I have a feeling they're going to be in for a bit of an education. And part of that education stems from what I think you just said is that 
you know, we, we're not a day behind anymore, so to speak. We have, mm-hmm. we're, you know, we're different, but I think, I think that the, the conception I have, let me just throw a conception or two at you. And I, I have a dear friend who was a former newscaster in Alaska as well. Um, and she kind of set me straight on some things years ago. And she said, you know, I mean, yeah, of course we're, we're a rugged people. We, you know, we obviously, you don't choose to live a place that has so little sunlight certain times of the year. If you're, if you're kind of a panty waste or whatever you want to call it, there, there's a, there is definitely, a ruggedness and a strength to it, but I, I think it's I think it's an overstatement and oversimplification to say that, isn't it? I mean, there's still, as we talked, as I in my intro said, you know, there's people who are, you know, one way or another, but we're all human there. I guess is the point. Um, not everybody there is a mountain man. Is probably one of the things. No, absolutely true. So half the people live in the Anchorage area. Anchorage, of course, is the largest city city there, and so. Of the three quarters of a million people who live in Alaska, half of them live in a metropolitan area. And in fact, here's a misconception. Alaska is the most urbanized state in the union. A higher percentage of people live in cities in Alaska than in any other state. And Vermont's the most rural. So, and the reason, one of the reasons of course is, is that as soon as you get out of the main city, you have very few services, Hmm. almost none. And it's, it doesn't take you very long to get off the grid entirely. So it's very difficult to live outside of metropolitan areas. Oh, yeah, I totally did not, did not know that. Well, the, the, let's talk a little bit about uh, the background for the novel then, the legislative background. Now, you, you lobbied the, the Alaska State Legislature on behalf of environmental concerns. And by the way, I just read some very disturbing stuff about what Trump wants to do to Tongass. Uh, open it up, right? That's, is that the latest thing? Uh, um, right, yeah. He, he has already done that. So, so there's a there's a rule in all of the of the nation's national forests that wilderness areas or, or areas that don't have roads can't have new roads built into them. So it's called the roadless rule, and that's been around since oh boy more than 20 years I think now. And the Tongass was the last national forest to be included in that rule, and it was a big fight to include it in that rule. So now he's exempted that the, the national forest again from the rule. So new roads can be built into roadless areas for the purposes of logging. Yeah, it's, I, it's disturbing, but is this what we're up against every time there's a new president? If they just want to, with the stroke of a pen, say, we're gonna exempt these things, is that, is that really how vulnerable the forests are? Well, you can certainly see that, in, and I don't wanna to get too political here, but the, Certainly a lot of what Trump has done in his, in his four years in office has been to undo what the previous administration has done. And, and yes, you're speaking on a, on a larger issue. It's, it's easy for a, a, a president or an executive to order something through an executive order or through some kind of, of uh, regulatory procedure that hasn't gone through the legislature. But when you do it that way, then it's very easy for the next guy to come along and undo it. So actually, I was part of the fight. I was running another organization, Southeast Alaska Conservation Council, when we were, when there was the fight to bring the Tongass into the roadless rule. And my objection at the time was that the, I said that this would be undone as soon as we get another Republican president. That what we really needed to do is do the hard work of having a legislative bill pass which protected areas, these wilderness areas. And that would be a decade long campaign. I mean, that would take a long time to have happen, but once it's happened, it would not be undone. Yeah, so put, put in all the hard work at the, at the beginning so you're not constantly dealing with this every other administration practically. Yeah, it makes sense, it makes sense. But, um, but I, if I could just interrupt just for a moment, Alex, this rule won't stand. I mean, it, Trump, what Trump has done now is it, he's fighting, you know, last year's war or mm. the last war and the cultural shift in, in Southeast Alaska is such, and the infrastructure isn't there really to, 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 to support large scale logging like there was back in the nineties and the eighties, sixties. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So I, 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 I don't think, I, I think in the long term that this rule is just a dead letter. Oh, I had no idea. I, I think, see, there we go. Um, I just make the assumption, oh, well, logging must be pretty simple up there. But yeah, I guess you're right. If, if you're continuing to 
diminish the that industry it's not like you can just flip a switch and oh yeah we can go log that whole thing right now okay makes sense and so when you worked with uh, as a lobbyist with the legislature now does the legislature meet every year or every other year no it's every year it's every year now okay um and it's it's bicameral yes okay but um have you found that the did you find when you were lobbying the legislature was was it pretty evenly split to your if you if I can be simplistic about about Alaskans who wanted to um, you know try to exploit the uh, exploit the uh, the things that Alaska has or did you find versus the folks who no we want to preserve was there a pretty evenly split or does it just depend no not at all so so Alaska is one of the like one of the, the states in, in, in the American Midwest, which are largely dependent on their natural resources. So unlike say the, the economies on the coast, which are much more service oriented, right? Alaska is like Montana and Wyoming and Nevada really, really dependent on their natural resources and certainly oil more than, more than anything. So, so because the economy is that way, that's the way that the, the political system is. And so an environmental, um, environmental approaches usually are an up, uphill battle. And as, a, and as a lobbyist, most of what I could do was not passing good things, but trying to stop bad things. It's a lot easier in a democracy to stop things from happening than to make things happen. Hmm, very true. Okay. Well, I just wanted to kind of get a little background there as we go into Ren's Crossing. If you don't mind, can you, can you give, us the, give us the blurb here? What's going on in this book? Okay, so there's a lot going on in this book. I, I wanted to make a really complex novel that would make you think, right? <laughs> so, so, so the first thing, the first thing that, that starts is, is and, it, and, it, and it was sparked by, by a fantasy that I had, you know, a number of years ago when the logging in the Tongass was really, really quite, quite horrific. And that is, I was thinking, well, why nice to sneak into one of these logging camps and take out all their machinery? Right, these logging camps are 50, 60 miles away from the closest village. There's no security there. It'd be no problem at all to go in there and take out their machinery. All right. And not that it would do any good because, you know, the industrial onslaught is relentless and, and they, all the machines would just be put back by the next week, but it would be really cathartic. And, <laughs> and then I thought, wow, well, what happens if somebody else were accused of my crime? What would I do? And so that was a little bit of the genesis right there. So the opening scene is a, the main character, Rin, sabotaging the logging, the, uh, the, 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 the equipment of a logging camp, All right? And then his ex-lover gets accused of the crime oh. and of a murder that coincidentally happened on the same evening, the same night. So she's now has a murder charge against her. So, so Rin's, Rin's, uh, you know, Rin's, Rin needs to get her off the hook without getting himself on the hook. So that's where, that's where he needs to, that's, that's his initial struggle. But then Kit, his ex-lover, right, there's a big legislative battle in the state legislature. So one of the things that has, you know, riven Alaska is that promises were made to the native Alaskans way back when their land claims are settled in 1971. And that promise has never been fulfilled, even till today, it has not been fulfilled. And that promise was, was to give the natives first say, first crack at subsistence resources, at hunting like moose and caribou, when when the resource when there was wasn't enough of the resource to go around so it's called a subsistence preference mm. okay and you can see that's that's tremendously controversial within the state so the legislative battle was to trade the subsistence amendment which had to be an amendment to the constitution with four bills that the people that oppose a subsistence amendment wanted. So this is a classic legislative sausage, right? So the people on the left are supportive of the, of the amendment, but the people on the right oppose the amendment, but want these bills. Kit, 
because she's a single issue person here, right? This is the thing, because she's a single issue person has to oppose the amendment because that's the only way she'll stop the two environmental bills in that package. All right, so, so that's a long, long explanation to say that there's this tremendous legislative battle and Kit with a murder charge against her is in the middle of. Did you find it tricky when you wrote this, the book to, I mean, the, the ins and outs, the political intrigue, did you find it though that it got to a point where it might've been a little, you know, all the ins and outs of how a legislative process works, did you have to worry about that a little bit or did you, did you kind of glide over the top or did you get in the nitty gritty? So everything that happens in this book could happen in real life. There's no floating over the top. On, on, and, you know, if, if your question is, did it get complex? Yes, it got complex. And, and that, was, that was a concern. Because, you know, you know I was thinking of a, a police procedural where, you know, the, the police detective goes through all the procedure that, a, that, a, that, a, that he has to do or she has to do in that kind of genre, in a police right. procedural. So in the same way, I went through a legislative procedural right and but i had to do it of course that i didn't one didn't lose the reader and two didn't bore them hmm. that was tricky I, that took a bit of a bit of practice but a bit of work i'll tell you it it is tricky is i mean it really is tricky i uh, that's one of the reasons i, I could never really well m not one of many that i couldn't get into tom clancy much was there's just so much minutia and i i, I like i don't really need to know how a gun works i just need to know somebody got shot right. um but, but I'm also by the same way, I think that I, I I'm a firm believer, uh, Russell, that, that readers do like to learn about people's jobs. Mm -hmm. I don't care if they're a plumber. I don't care. I have found in my own work that when people read about like a, a certain thing and I've done some research and I've kind of literally I had one about a plumber and people were like, I had no idea about that old joke about plumbers, you know, paydays on Friday, uh, and don't chew your fingernails and all blah, blah, blah. This is the whole saying that plumbers have. Anyway, I'm, I'm blanking on all of it. But I think people enjoy learning about other people's work. And I think that uh, there's a great deal of mystery about how the sausage is made in our own government. So, Well, you know, certainly the reviewers haven't, you know, both the, the Amazon reviews and the, and the professional reviewers, no one, in the, no one has really said that, that they got lost in the legislative battle. You know, they all found it very, very compelling. So I'm, so I, that was my big relief. That was my big concern about the book. So it's a, so just you know, for your listeners, it's a challenging book, but it's a challenging book that will have you just turning pages. It'll drive you right through that, through the story. Well, and you've got some uh, pretty nice uh, other reviewers here, including a former governor of Alaska, Tony Knowles, uh, wrote a very nice uh, review for you. There, nice blurb there, huh? So may I interrupt. Do you know where he was born, Alex? No, where? Oklahoma. Get out of here. Yeah, that's what I said. You know, I just thought he was your roommate. <laughs> this is freaking me out a little bit. Oh, I just thought you meant, because I knew, I knew who Tony Knowles was as a governor, but yeah. I, had, I thought you were saying he was my roommate because it's from the, I had no idea he was from Oklahoma. Yep. My gosh. By the way, Jim Lair, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, the, Jim the, Lair, right. Of Jim course. Lair wrote the books. See, there, see, there it is. Mm. Um, but you also had a, a state senator, right, uh, also saying that it was... Um, Complex, riveting, and right out of the headlines. He, who paid his dues with years in Alaska, nails Alaska's zeitgeist. Uh, so that's good. That's good to know. So what I'm hearing, of course, is that, yeah, you've got the intricacies of legislation and the ins and outs and all that, the intrigue there. But you also, you're imbuing the book with all this good flavor that serves as the backdrop for the, for the moral issue here. This guy's, that ren has got to deal with, you know, you know, he did this thing and do I, my gosh, do I leave my ex-lover hanging out to dry or not? Um, well, there, there are lots of moral issues. I, I was impressed by your, your lead in, your introduction here, you know, crossing the line, because one of the things I wanted to point out, or one of the things I really wanted to struggle with in the novel is that, you know, most of us in our day-to-day -day lives live really low stake li lives. We yeah. don't have much at stake. We live in a, you know, a super safe, by historical standards, a super safe environment. We all know we're gonna be, most of us know that we're gonna have food on the table tonight. We know that our kids, when we send them off to school, you know, COVID aside, right, they're going to come home in the evening, right? So it's really easy to follow the law and be ethical and moral when the stakes are low. 
But what do you do when the stakes start ramping up? What do you do when the start stakes get, get higher? You know, at what point do you say, you know, for the benefit of my family or my career or whatever, I step over the line? And so there are four characters in Rian's Crossing, three are friends and one is not, one's an antagonist, but all four of them step over the line and all four of them betray each other because they're all headed in different directions in some way. So this is, this is the real complexity of the novel is, is you know, the moral decisions that they make and the fact that they make them at the expense of their friends. You know, I I came across this understanding about this. I I grew up in a situation. Don't worry, I'm not going to psychoanalyze myself here. But I grew up in a situation where I had to learn as an adult that uh, I have very black and white thinking, and people can draw their own conclusions of what kind of upbringing I had that I develop, or things are either you're either, you're either good or you're bad. Um, but I learned through through therapy and things like that that. And I'll never forget the therapist saying, Alex, you, you seem to labor under the misapprehension that, that there are good people and bad people. They're just people. Um, you know, he says, without being too uh, uh, cliche, life is shades of gray. Mm -hmm. and, and also, like you just said, um, you know, I have a daughter, I have a wife, I have a home. I live a very comfortable life. And I agree with you totally. People say, oh, crime's so horrible in America. It's not comparatively. Historically, we live in a utopia to a large degree. I'm not trying to belittle problems we have, but in, relatively to history. Mm -hmm. um, but what I have learned and what has served me so very well, not only as a human being, but also as a writer, is to also not write these characters who are the mustache twirling villains. Because there's very, if any, there's very few human beings who really look at themselves in the mirror and go, you're a bad person. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't think that happens much. Is that kind of where we're, we're getting here? Is that, are we simpatico on that thought? Yes, totally. And, and in fact, I'd add, add to that. Even those people who, from our point of view, are villains, I know in their heads, they think they're right, that they have a rationale that explains to them why what they're doing, whether it's raping or bank robbing or whatever, is right. And they usually see themselves as a victim, right? So that... They justify their criminality through victimhood. You know, and I, again, not trying to be political, but we're seeing a lot of grievance culture right now and a lot of people professing victimhood, I think. And, and that's, I think it's important what you just said to look at it through that prism because a lot of these folks feel aggrieved about things and people who disagree with them politically or socially are like, oh, come on. You, you know, here, I'll throw it back in what you said. We live relatively in the greatest circumstance a humankind has ever lived in and you have grievances about this stuff but it's back to what you said right they they're looking in the mirror and they're saying this has been taken from me this is endangering my way of life oh man it's human behavior it is quite a uh, yeah, thing to explore I, I, and i don't think there's anything unusual i think this is part of who we are but the tendency always 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 is to look through a lens of victimhood and there's a, there's a thing that, you know, you can say legitimately, for instance, say African-Americans can see themselves as victims in, in, in the society or, you know, a woman who's been beaten by her husband or, or raped on the street. You know, you can say, yes, there, that's, there's some victimhood there. But what's key is, is that if you don't start looking at what happens to you from a different point of view than victimhood, then the pain that you've experienced from that crime is going to be transmitted. So pr pain not transformed is pain transmitted. And that's the danger of looking at whatever's happened to you, whatever your circumstances in life, through a lens of victimhood. So I know we're getting a little away from Rins Crossing. I just need to say that, that I'm a life coach and I deal with this on like a daily basis. <laughs> well, and I knew that. And I, I kind of yeah. thought I'd get a little free, uh, free advice from you on that one. Though. But right. I will, uh, just, just to move us back to the book, I'll just say this, though. I think you're 100% correct. And I think it was when I started realizing that uh, I, can, I, I need to transition. Uh, I, I don't have to necessarily transform as a human, but I do need to transition away from the things 
uh, that weren't good and, and, and not view my life as a victim of something. So I think that's really important. Now, l- let's, let's talk a little bit about writing for a second here because I, I can't, I, I'm watching the clock. I know I don't have you forever here because I've got a question towards the end. I've got to ask you about your, your, your adventured life. I've got to. But let's talk about the writing aspect, though. Um, now, you, this is not your first book. You've had a few books out, um, and some of them actually have garnered some, some really excellent critical praise and I believe Ren's Crossing is, uh, is doing as well. Do you, do you enjoy the process of writing or do you find it tedious? What, just the, the basic writer's question, how do you feel about writing itself? All right, can I tell you a story? Please. All right, so you know, I wanted to be a writer you know, in the same way that I wanted to be president or you know, a rock star or a supermodel or whatever. And, and every time I got started, and you know, I would get started before their computers, you know, I'd have this blank piece of paper in front of me and, and by lunchtime I'd given up. I had, and there's no way that I knew how to move forward. And then it was back in the mid, mid to late nineties, I was kayaking around this big island in Northern, in Southeast Alaska, it's called Baranoff Island. It was a three week kayak trick to get around that island. And I was with a friend and, and she read a, a mystery story by a local Alaskan author. And when she finished it, I said, was it any good? And she said, oh yeah, it's really great. So I read it and it was terrible. I and mean, it was beyond dreadful. It was appalling. And I said, Irene, you told me this was great. This, is, this stinks. And she said, yeah, I know. I said, well, I didn't want to influence your opinion. And I said, well, I want my opinion influenced. I, don't, I spent hours of my life. I wasted hours of my life reading this trek. And then, and then right at that point, I said, I can do better, you know, which is, which is the ultimate hubris, right, of, of the guy who doesn't have a clue what he's getting into. And, and so it was at that point I was committed to writing a book. <clears throat> and, you know, the problem was, well, I spent the next year with that blank piece of paper. So how do you get started? And because the, because what I'd read was a mystery story, I said, okay, I'll write a mystery story. And, and, you know, I didn't know how to get started. And I mean, it was comical. And then I thought, I remembered a book I'd read recently by Jane Smiley called A Thousand Acres, right? And that won the Pulitzer Prize. But what it, you're halfway through it and you realize it's a scene by scene ripoff of King Lear. I said, wait a minute, she should have been hauled off to jail for plagiarism, but now she gets a Pulitzer Prize. Well, I'll do that. I'll just find some playwright who's dead, is not gonna come after me, you know, <laughs> if I steal his best stuff. So I'd start chewing around, you know, what's a good, what good play to, to, to steal? And, and, uh, and I realized, well, the first mystery in Western canon is Oedipus Rex by Sophocles. And Sophocles has been dead for two and a half millennium, so I'm probably pretty safe. And uh, so I, my first book, Broken Angels, was, was, it wasn't a scene by scene ripoff, but it started, it started the process of how do I turn Oedipus Rex into a story that happens in, in Alaska. And I'm getting to your point here. And I was so convinced that I would give up on this story. It's like, like I, my hundredth diet, right? Yet again, I want to lose another five pounds. And yet again, by the next day, I'm, I'm chowing down on the, you know, on the Twinkies. I was so timid so tentative about getting started that I limited myself to just working a few hours a day and then I had to quit. So I had a deadline when I had to quit. And that's what I did for the first, oh, three or four months. I just write a couple hours a day and then I quit. And then I write a few more hours (laughs) and then I quit. And it was about a year before I started realizing, hey, this is kind of fun. And it had taken over my mind. I'd be working on the plot and how do you develop this character? And then all of a sudden it was full day. It was all day. And, and I'd be exhausted by the end of it. So, so it was, you know, I had to lead myself into this really, really slowly because I tried so many times in the past and failed so many times that I had no real hope that I would see the project through. Yet, uh, Broken Angels was a finalist for the best independently published mystery. It was. How did, did that did that do anything for you? 
when you got that. Oh, I was so pissed off. You, you know what? You know what? The, the, <laughs> you know what the psychology of the of the silver medal winner is. You know, there's been a lot of research is that 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 the person who wins a silver medal in the Olympics, his his or her life is ruined because they think if I just go on. 0.001% faster, it was, you, you would have gotten the gold. Whereas the bronze person is really happy because at least they were in the color, right? They, at least they were, <laughs> they were on the podium. So yeah, so you don't want to come in second ever. You know, that's what I'm, I, I'm just uh, joking. I was, I was quite pleased. It was my first oh, book after all. It was your first book. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> no, I, but I've been there. I've had several of my books get honorable mention or you know, whatever. And, and after a while, you're like, uh, okay, yeah. So I, I understand that feeling. But the one time when I actually won first prize on a short story, I dined out on that sucker. Well, wait, what day is it? I've been dining out on that for 12 years. I mean, it's just, I don't care. Um, no, that, that's fantastic. I, I was just curious about that. Now, are you, are you somebody who, um, just through, through the course of your daily life, something hits you and you're like, I'm going to, Ooh, that's the new, that's the new book. Or are you more methodical about it than that? Do you have to, do you think on it and think this is next? So, so good question. You know, I mean, the first time it was, it was Oedipus Rex that got me started. Right. And I knew how Oedipus and ended. So I, I knew how my novel had to end. And they worked back from backwards from there. Rims Crossing I knew how the novel ended. I wanted it to end right away. And I knew how I wanted it to begin. You know, how it be began was, was, you know, sabotaging that logging camp on the one hand. And then I had this, this, you know, this, I knew I had this really interesting material in the Alaska State Legislature. So I had to meld it all together. So, you know, it was a year of thinking that to put that through. You know, it's, again, I mean, I'm really quite pleased with the novel because there are five different plot lines that go through it. And there are no loose ends. No one's yet said, well, what happened to Joe back here on, you know, page 63? You know, it's, it's all really tightly plotted. But I'm working on a, on a sequel to Broken Angels, the second one. And it took me a couple of years to figure out what it was that, that so the main character is a woman, what it was that Chris Gabriel, who's Alaska Native, is fighting for the second time. So in Oedipus, you know, the Oedipus was a king of Thebes and what he was fighting for was the truth. But what I couldn't have her fight for truth again, you know, she had to fight for something else. So it took a while to figure out what it was that she was fighting for. And once that happened, then I could write the book. It's, uh, that, you took the, the next question right out of my mouth on that. I was curious about that. I, I, it's a question I've been asking all of my guests lately is, um, are, are you into, you know, creating a series or sequels? Is that something you set out to? Nobody's told me they started out to start a series. Nobody's told me that. But the ones who did write one or two or three mostly said they they seem to be capping it around three because three is a great number. And the feeling was that a lot of the series started petering out sales-wise after three. Um, do you put that much thought into going forward or is it all about, look, I'm just going to tell a good story until I can't tell a good story anymore? Well, I'd like to say the latter, but I, I'm, I'm coming in on the, so, so as you as an author, we all know that unless we're Tom Clancy, the, 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 the biggest struggle of being an author is marketing your book and selling it. Right. Yeah. It's infinitely more difficult than writing the damn thing. And there, there are far more authors out there than there are, successful. There, there are far more authors with books out there than, than with, with bank accounts that, you know, that are hefty enough to pay the mortgage and put some beans on the table. Um, and what I've discovered in my investigation of, of, of marketing is that there's a whole subset, and you may have run into this in your, in talking with other authors, but there's a whole, um, I don't know what it's called, you know, subculture of authors that have learned how to use Amazon specifically to sell their books and sell their books in such a way that they make a good living that they, in, in a way that they could not if they went with a traditional route. Yeah. In fact, the traditional route is so difficult. My, my cousin used to be head of Picador, you know, an imprint for, for Macmillan. And, you know, he said, oh, Russell, there are only like 100, 100 
people in the country who are making money, you know, supporting themselves on their fiction. I think he was he was exaggerating, but not you know if you take out Stephen King, you know, there are not many left, right? <laughs> so I don't think the traditional route is the way to go anymore. I yeah. think that there's a that, that the shift in marketing is to do it self-publishing. And we have total creative control, and and you can um, and you can use Amazon, and these people that have discovered how to use Amazon, how to develop a list, how to develop fans, how to use a website, um, have been really quite successful. And one of the key strategies is to have a series, is to have a series of books. So you know, just for example, you use the first two books as loss leaders to get the people engaged in the series, and then you you raise the price to a, a you know, again, it's only electronic that they're dealing with three or four bucks a copy or five or six dollars a copy, and so you build a fan base. And if your series peters out, then you can start another series and bring your fan base over. Right. So so I'm actually you know considering that as as a you know as a as an option. I, I recommend it. I've got my series is at seven. I'm in the middle of book eight, although sorry, sorry, listeners who love my series and thank you. Um, probably this will be it for, or a long time. Um, but I have found that the, the long tail does seem to work and using the first two or three couple of books, at least as, as you say, lost leaders, get them, get, get your foot in the door and do that. And I don't know about you, but I sell, I'd say 85% our, our ebook now hardly anybody buys the paperbacks anymore right. i guess that's just the way it is so but but i want to I, I appreciate you being so candid about that and i mean i think if you're smart like you said if you learn how to not game the system but use the system particularly with amazon to work for you you can definitely do these things well okay i've kept you a good good long time but i've appreciated this but i gotta ask you something okay because here's the, here's something real quick here i have determined that when COVID is mostly behind us, uh, I'm in Missouri. Um, I there's the Katy Trail. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Katy Trail. Okay, it's it's basically 285 miles of it's old railroad trail, but they've turned it into yep. hiking trail. Okay, right. all right. I want to on my own. I wanted to walk the whole thing. I probably will not, but I have carved out a chunk of it that will take me about a week to do mm-hmm. front and back by myself. And I, I've done these, see, I'm a very, very small patch on you on this. I used to go camping by myself. I go bouldering by myself. I would do those things, but I never would dream of doing what you've done, however, which is to actually cross the ocean by yourself in a boat. What possessed you? When did this happen? If you could just give us a, a couple of details on this, I'm just dying to know more about it. Well, well, well the question's unanswerable. I haven't a clue, right? I mean, why do you like chocolate ice cream? Who the hell knows? <laughs> but, but what was happening is I was in Alaska and I was skiing with a buddy up on this up on this ridge. And this is all backcountry skiing. And, you know, we were in the clouds. You could hardly see a thing. And, and my buddy was a, he'd done two tours in Vietnam. He was a, his next Marine. And, you know, we didn't know about PTSD back then, but, but that's what he had. And he hadn't cut his hair since, since mustering out of the Marines. It was down to his waist, right? And he lived on a little boat, a 27 foot, fiberglass boat down in the harbor in Juneau and and you know we're just we're, we're, we're skiing down this ridge and I say hey Don what, what are you gonna do with the boat where are you gonna go sailing her and I was figuring you know he'd sail her to the next village or something and he says I'm gonna sail her into the South Pacific <laughs> and I said you can do that <laughs> I had no idea right <clears throat> he said sure no problem so I said, well, let's get off this ridge. So I got off this ridge really quick and I, I went down to the library and I found the sailing section of the library. I had never in my life been in the sailing section of the library, right? And I get this fat old book by a man named Eric Hiscock. He and his, he and his wife, Susan, had, had sailed around the world in the 50s back when it was really exciting. And I read that book like a thriller. I did not sleep. I mean, it was like 600 pages of really dense of high, of all this, you know, uh, 1950s technology, which wouldn't do you a damn bit of good today. And, and I was hooked. At that point, there was no choice. I had, I had no choice. It was like God leaned out of the clouds and hit me by, on the side of the head with a two by four and said, you're going sailing, boy. <laughs> Don't turn back. Yeah. And, you know, I... I had, I'd been on a sailboat before, but, but the highest position I'd ever gotten to was just keep out of the way. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I, I didn't, I, I didn't have a faintest idea what I was doing. What, 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 how big a boat was it? 25 foot. 25 foot, 25 foot. Wooden boat. Yeah. Wooden boat sails. I yeah. assume maybe a trolling motor if you needed it. Is that it? No, no, I didn't have a motor, but I put an outboard on the back so I could dink around in harbors and things. But. Yeah, right. Okay, right. And how long did it, how long were you out? Four years. Four years. Thir 37,000 miles. Now, have you written extensively about that uh, in a book or anything, telling that whole tale? And if, if you have, forgive me if I missed that. But. No, I haven't. That's the, actually the next project. I, I figured it, it's about time to write that. But, you know, I'll tell you, I gave a talk to the Explorers Club in New York City. I watched a portion of it. Oh, you did? It didn't keep you, huh? You got... Well, I got cut off when it was time for the interview. I was like, oh, shoot, I should have watched this earlier. I, I got to the puking. You got to the puking. So you, <laughs> so you, so you got to the second day on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you would, just put that link in, the, in, your, in your show notes for your crew. So, so I did give a talk to the Explorers Club about the trip right um and it's you know the if if i ever get to finishing writing a book about it you know that's the that's the introduction that's the trailer to the book oh man that's that is fantastic R russell i have scratched the surface of things i'd love to talk to you about um what i love folks when i do these interviews is and, and if you listen to the show you'll see this happens fairly often but um is to meet a writer who is not so consumed just with their book but with life and talking about life and going around and talking about the aspects of life that lead to good fiction and good reading and good adventures and Sir, I, I, I doff my cap to you. I am so impressed. I've got a, another, another couple of books to add to my stack on my bedside table now. Um, and when that book comes out about your, your exploits on the high seas, uh, please, please consider coming back and talking to us, would you? Oh, you, you, you take a sailor as opposed to a mystery writer? Absolutely, I would. Are you kidding me? This is fantastic. No, I've always wanted to do the same thing, but I, I, I don't have the guts to go out by myself. And, and I've got a 12-year-old daughter who uh, would not allow it. But I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. Um, if we want to learn more about Russell Heath, we just need to go to russellheathauthor.com. And it's a very comprehensive site. We've got everything you need to know. We have links to buy your books. And I will include that. Plus, I will include that YouTube in the show notes. Uh, normally, folks, if you uh, go to mgopod.com, you know I always have a YouTube link to the interviews that at least has an excerpt or two. Instead of that, I think it'll be really interesting to put this uh, talk you gave to the Explorers Club in there. So, again, Rins Crossing. Uh, where would you, you want them to go to Amazon, right? That's the place you want them to go, right? Or does it matter? And, anywhere they can buy the book. Yeah, Amazon, their local bookstore. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you so very much for taking time to join us here on Mysterious Goings On. Hey, thank you, Alex. It's been a lot of fun. All right, folks. It has been a lot of fun for me, too. Don't forget, check the show notes at mgopod.com. we got a lot more coming your way before 2020. Hopefully, sloughs away into the night, and it, we'll just enjoy it by reading great works by people like Russell Heath. Okay, until next time, keep reading. <laughs>